Hello and welcome to Soundscape. I'm Rebecca Janney, your host today. Until the 21st century, the physical state of music has always stood in the way of its convenience. These days, it's available all around us and is more accessible than it's ever been to both the artist and the listener. Whether it be through radio, a streaming service, or entirely unintentional, like the music you're hearing right now. On this episode of Soundscape, we'll learn about the Milwaukee Music Businesses, the exclusive company, and Acme Records that are affected by this accessibility. Later on, we'll learn about what goes on in the recording studio from Tom Riddle, a sound engineer and the owner of Story Studio. We'll then hear from another sound engineer, Paul Knievers, who's been recording and producing since 1989 with over 600 album credits about the changing landscape of music production. Afterwards, we'll have Tom Riddle demonstrate how microphones are set up for different instruments and motivations behind his choices. But first, let's focus on the enthusiasts that still buy physical music in the age of accessibility, who collect music for more than just to listen to them. One of these enthusiasts is Paul Host, who's been collecting music since the 1970s and has built up a collection of around 20,000 records, CDs, cassettes, and more. What do you have for us here today, Paul? Hello, Rebecca. Hello. Uh, just a mix of things that have been over the decades. Of course, I still like to buy new records. There's some that are brand new, and there's also... Brand new, but vintage. Right? Well, o old and new, like okay. this one is from 2021, and this Polynesian record is from like the 60s. Oh, okay. So just a mix. And uh, also, I've picked up at rummage sales a few 78s. Sometimes I like them for the covers, like with the RCA Nipper Dog, or a lot of people may not realize that before World War II, these were melted down to make hand grenades. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why the ones from pre-World War II are very rare. And I got that on good authority from uh, Dewey Gill at MSC. Okay. And um, I like a lot of local stuff. I do a local podcast. And this is just one of eight boxes of local singles. And of course, it's a lot of CDs. Love to still play them in the car. And um, of course, bought cassettes from bands. Also, mixtapes that we used to make for our travels. Um, I think I made a couple of mixtapes, like for my girlfriends or special occasions yeah. there. Sure, brings back good memories. They're a lot of fun, and you put your favorite stuff on, so how can you go wrong? You know? Exactly. Uh, Edison Cylinder, also listened to a lot of these going down the road, and then the music kind of led me to collecting flyers for local band shows. And uh, like I said, I've even got one here from Channel 10, and this one was done by Guy Hoffman who was also in the, besides the Oil Tasters, he was also in the Violin Femmes and the Bodines. Nice. The 8-track tapes, I feel it's kind of like the CDs that I have. I probably have like two racks of them. I don't listen to them anymore, but I have them, right? So of your collections, what is your favorite right now? Uh, it's, I like all genres of music, basically. You know, everything from hip-hop to punk to reggae, to gospel music. I've learned that, you know, by being a listener to the radio, to WMSE, all the other DJs have uh, taught me a lot of new things. Sure. And you also were a DJ at one point, so I'm sure that kind of helped you in your collecting as well? Yeah. It just kind of feeds into it. It's like, that was my hobby. Other people golf or fish. I decided to be a volunteer DJ and collect music and I have a whole circle of friends and we all get together. And, and there's quite a bit of history know. behind music as well, mm -hmm. whether it be albums or CDs or even posters. It's interesting to go and see all of it. Yeah. Well, Paul, you have brought a vast collection of different varieties of tangible music that is awesome that we can still enjoy. So thank you for coming to the studio today. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. While not everyone can have the time and resources and space to collect music, anyone can still get started themselves. Let's take a look at two Milwaukee businesses that still flourish today because of people that enjoy collecting music.
You can't just go into a, a store and just buy a collection of records. It's a, it's a thing that takes several years to build and amass and catalog and um, appraise it, put it in order, put that love and care into it. I mean, my, my personal record collection is probably not as big as it should be for how long I've been collecting, but it's, it didn't, I mean, it didn't come overnight by any means. Records specifically have become very expensive. What used to be kind of a $15 price point is now $25, $30. And it's the same thing happened with CDs. When CDs first came out, there was a $15 to $17 price point. And then when CDs really took off, um, the music industry kind of tried to see what the most they could charge for a CD was. And I think they're doing the same thing with records. I think recently people are starting to feel cheated by, by paying for music that they're not able to hold. Streaming music, I think, has affected the sales of physical media up until recently. When streaming first hit, it definitely, you could feel the effect of, of it on, on physical media sales for sure. Um, but there's always been and there always will be record collectors. Records are cool. They're trending. I have people that buy records that don't even have a record player. Uh, they're, they're using the download and they like seeing records around. I think there was a niche to it that people really appreciated. People like to have something tangible. And, and streaming music is its kind of boring. <laughs> it's kind of a lonely endeavor. We use streaming in the store just to, to play things that we want to test out. The biggest advantage for the artist is that people all around the world of, of different socioeconomic statuses can access their music. You get fans that otherwise couldn't afford your music. I still stream music, you know. And I think, I think most of the people that work here still stream music. It's not, the thing about it is there, there really kind of is space for all of these things to exist. The question is not so much about what format needs to tower over another format. The big problem with streaming in the music industry is that it just, streaming platforms don't pay artists. More and more people these days are buying records. I, I, I still hear a fair amount of peop, like people walking in the store and they say, wow, they, they still make records or I heard they're making records again. And, and in actuality, no one ever stopped making records. If streaming services are held accountable for what they're paying artists, then probably streaming services will be just as inconvenient as physical media, at which point people will just probably start buying physical media. It might even be the norm right now, or as close to the norm as we could get. I don't know that it will be for everyone ever. You know, it takes up space, it's heavy, there's not a lot of ease in it, or, whereas, you know, carrying music around in your phone, that's, that's appealing to a fair amount of people, and I think always will be. I think there's always going to be a niche for physical media. I don't know that it'll be the norm ever again. I would be surprised. Collecting music can mean so much to people, but let's not forget about the minds behind the production of music. We have in the studio Tom Riddle to tell us more about the recording process. Hi, Tom. Hi, how, how are, are you? you? I'm, I'm well. I'm good, thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. So tell us, Tom, why would someone come to your studio? Why would um, someone come to Story Studio in Milwaukee? Well, if I think what you're asking is why would they come to me as opposed to trying it at home or yes. me versus someone else? No, you um, versus. So I'm a modern production studio, primarily digital, although I do a lot of analog recording of instruments and drums and vocals and the rest of it. Um, but I like to think that that's kind of my specialty. As a vocal coach, I do a lot of vocal production, a lot of vocal recording, and people come to me when they're not quite ready, uh, but they can come and sing through it with me and get coaching, and not just engineering asking you, would you like to do it again? Um, but more than that, uh, even though technology and recording is so available at home these days, uh, the technical side of it can be stifling creatively. 
Absolutely. What about in your role of as a producer? What would you say is your main goal, or what are you thinking of the most? The most important thing is the artist vision. You know, if they came to me and they trusted me to try and take their dream out of their mind and make it real for other people to see and listen to, the most important thing I can do is not impart what I want uh, on an emotional side, but try and impart what I need in a technical side to get their emotional content forward and just trying to elevate their idea and what they want. And what about the role of a sound engineer? So is that different from the producer? Is it the same? Um, all of these hats are getting swapped around and, and, and a lot of small operators like myself or Paul Knievers, we end up doing a lot of the work of the engineering and the production all at once. Um, and so really the difference is a sound engineer is responsible for knowing his studio, knowing his gear, knowing his environment and getting the sound you need now, not later, not 10 hours from now, but being able to go, oh, you want a driven guitar, you want it to feel like it's coming out of a 1967 Cadillac, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And the producer's job is to imagine that sound beforehand and to imagine where it sits in the project and the record and the song and to work with the engineer dynamically to find that. But these days, guys like me who are running a studio alone, I'm both engineer, producer, setup, intern, and <laughs> Director, <Mike> musician, <laughs> actor, you do it all. I've been to your studio, and I've seen some of your digital work, which is fascinating. Tell me, are there still clients that want to use analog? Absolutely. And I use kind of a hybrid system. All of my mic recording, all of my um, vocal mic recording and my two main boutique mics all come through analog preamps, through Neve 73 pre's, um, to add warmth and color that you just can't quite get from digital, whether it's emulation or not. And some people still want tape. It has such a distinct sound and feel. Uh, even in the world of analog tape, digital representations where I can take your record and run it through tape on the end, there's still something about seeing that analog stuff at work and hearing the magic and that warmth and color that it gives off. Absolutely. When it comes to the digitalization of our music industry right now, would you say that more and more artists, whether it be a beginning artist or someone at home in their garage, can come to you and also get a good recording? Yes, absolutely. Because you do it live as well as analog, as well as in digital form. Right. We can do live band recording where I track every member all at once. We can do multi-tracking, meaning I record the drums, bass, vocals, and guitar completely separately. I really specialize in taking smaller artists, young artists. I used to be uh, the program director at School of Rock Milwaukee and trying to find in the youth these guys and girls that have great ideas and just helping them elevate it at a level and a budget that they can both grab and understand. Well, Tom, thank you for coming in today. You are a very talented man and your studio is phenomenal. Well, thank you. That is Story Studio in Milwaukee. Now let's go behind the scenes at a local recording studio, Caneverland Productions, and let's dive deeper into the mind of a longtime sound engineer and producer. Physical product, albums and CDs. Once you bought them, you own them. They're not gonna go away. I have lost entire libraries from computers failing or hard drives failing. Anytime you're putting all of your eggs in one basket, it just seems dumb to me. When I've relied on computers to archive and library my music, I've had issues happen where I've lost music. So, um, what? tell me a computer that lasts forever. I don't know one. Tell me a vinyl record that lasts for 40 years. I have a bunch, hundreds of them. They still sound the same. There is an amazing warmth to it. And from a personal experience here in the studio, a lot of artists will record directly to digital, but there was a session going on where they were recording to the multi-track tape machine. And they were playing it back. And the warmth of it was just, it was really amazing. It was very eye-opening. And it had such an incredible sort of presence that well, you know, the quality of digital audio is phenomenal and it's, you know, wonderful and there's a, a, a tremendous a universe of possibilities. There is something that is very significant about the sort of warmth and the presence of analog sound. There is an attention to audio quality 
uh, in the digital converters that's gotten pretty good. That being said, digital is still 20 to 20,000. That machine is 10 to 40,000. So it has more high end and more low end. The math of converting electromagnetic particles on tape to record sound, you're stirring up a thousand times more particles than you're doing digital conversion. It's all a moot point because everybody listens on MP3s, the crappiest format on the planet. So we spend all this time arguing about analog digital and then we downgrade it to MP3s that suck. Audio recording as it is today offers the ability to, to create and record music very easily. It requires very little skill and very little learning curve. Engineers from my era had to study and spend much more time researching the processes and practicing the processes of audio recording and producing. Packaging the sum knowledge of what we do, what we have done for decades, into software and plugins has given people a choice of tools and palettes far in excess of their ability to actually implement the tools. The real goals of old school audio engineers are multifaceted. Make the best product you can, do it on budget, and do it with the least amount of fuss process and anything. The older technology taught all of us to keep things simple in a way that you can hear on the audio recordings. Why do records sound so good? Because engineers did simple things routinely as a matter of course. Right now, we're putting out tons of musicians who self-produce, having all these tools, but are they making good judgment decisions? Well, why are people going back and listening to older recordings and finding charm in them? Because the, effect, the effectiveness of making high quality decisions with limited tools, I think, can lead a person to making better decisions because you don't overthink it. When you have too many tools, you have too many options. And then you also can't do it, rule two of a producer's rule book, do your album on budget, where you have a finite amount of time and money for the artist to do an album and for the record label or whoever's paying to pay for doing that album. So old school engineering provides a foundation that gets the job done quicker. And there's a real gap between why was it sounding good on analog tape? Well, it was not just the analog tape. It was the idea that you had limited resources and made them work as well as you can. Giving somebody all these tools also gives people more ego because everybody thinks they can do it themselves. Instead of knowing where their limitations are and focusing on their strengths, people nowadays Try and do too much. Creating and collaborating together. You don't get that in your bedroom at home. You don't get someone like me telling you, no, you need to practice more. You're not ready to perform that part. Come back in a week. You can't be successful if you don't have a little bit of that. You have to be driven and, and maniacal about your art and your songs and promoting and talking and everything that you do to be an artist and a musician. Is, is part of this massive push of your whole being being behind your art. That's not objective. How can you be objective and take those kind of attitudes? You can't. So the idea that a studio exists is a safe space for a musician to come in and open themselves up to a collaboration technically, personally, and creatively. And the, the end result is something that they couldn't do on their own.
sound engineers consider many factors when recording sound within every environment. So what if we wanted to record sound in the room that we're in right now? Tom Riddle will walk us through what goes on through his head for that exact scenario. Hi, Tom. Well, hello again. Can you please tell us what you have here and about recording in this space? Absolutely. Well, in a space like this, the possibilities are endless. We've got 35, 40-foot ceilings, 100 feet between walls. There's tons of space to do all kinds of things. But the most important thing to decide is what tool you're using and what you're going for. So if you're looking for something natural, like a singer-songwriter pop, you want a little bit of distance between you and the mic and definitely some distance from the mic to the wall. So you get some more open sound. You get a natural sound in this room that's got a nice reverb. But if you were looking to do something and we wanted to record in this room for more modern music, say hip hop, pop, something where I'm gonna create a lot of dynamic or digital elements on top of it, we'd wanna move this mic somewhere where it doesn't get quite as many reflections, closer to a dead wall like the curtains in the back or some of the softer elements behind us here, or at home, moving it in front of a closet full of nice, soft cotton clothes. Great idea. You brought some other microphones for us I as well. I did. Well, here on the stand, this is a Soyuz bomblet. This is an active FET condenser microphone. Condensers are the most popular microphones we think of when we think of studio recording. Uh, they're also the microphones uh, inside of our phones and most of our commercial devices. Sure. Uh, the other thing I brought today is actually an active ribbon. It's based on an older microphone design, but these have a FET amplifier, much like the Soyuz, inside of them. Uh, so they take 48 uh, phantom power. And the interesting thing about this is it has a much warmer signature. This is a high detail mic if you're trying to get soaring, say, Celine Dion kind of vocals out of it. This is gonna get all of that rich detail. This is gonna have less detail on the top end, but more warm character sound. And this one picks up in a figure eight, both in front and behind it. So for recording podcasts, when you have only one mic and you need to interview two people, or recording a guitar cabinet where you want the sound of the cabinet and the sound it's making in the room you're recording. And where would someone get something like that? You can get this uh, at Guitar Center, Musician's Friend. These you can get directly from any major music retailer or directly from Soyuz Microphones. Okay, and you brought my favorite I microphone did. here. I did. This is a brand new microphone by Tula called the Tula Mic. Uh, it's actually designed by one of the engineers that had a hand in designing the capsules and the amplifiers for the Soyuz Mics. But more importantly, the cool thing about this is it's a USB mic, like most modern things on the market. You can plug right in for Zoom meetings uh, into your computer. But the secret is the capsule design and the fact that it records onto itself for musicians on the go. You don't need a DAW, a computer, an interface. You can take this, record vocals, guitar, drums with active Clevgrand noise canceling. This is the future of recording, whether it's at home or in the studio. And where could we get something like that? You can buy these directly from Tula Mics, but I do know that Sweetwater's got a really cool promotion on them right now in any color you want. And for that Tula Mic, which is my favorite, maybe just because it looks adorable and compact, I'm not sure. But for that one, it would be good for you because you've actually heard a recording on yeah, it, Yeah, I correct? actually recorded through it some background vocals for a record I'm working on, and it sounded as fantastic as this with $1,000 less hardware in between it and my computer. And it would also be good for... Interviewers, podcasters, Perfect. students who are looking to capture anything, their classes, their friends, or their great ideas on the road. Out of the three, which would you say is your favorite? Out of the three, the easy favorite is my Soyuz. This is my centerpiece at the studio. <laughs> sure. But if this isn't within your budget, something like the Tula could really change the way you make music at home. And when people are podcasting, what would be the difference between that and the ribbon mic? Well, this microphone still needs a preamp or interface of some kind. So okay. you still need some intermediary between you and your computer, whereas this can plug in directly on a USB-C to record. Or without a computer, I can power it on, hook a lavalier mic to me, and interview you for the podcast, set it on the table, and it records two tracks of noise-canceled audio just to drop back onto your computer when you're done. And we were talking about this mic before. It's also going to come out with like a fort track, correct? Well, the, talk, Maybe? Uh, the talk is that they're coming out with one that'll have multi-track recording and one that'll be simpler with no recorder inside of it and it's just directly the microphone. But those are only rumors right now uh, <laughs> that I know because I know some of the guys at the company. So Tula Mics is definitely Mics. way to go. Well, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for coming in and showing us the different types of mics and where you would place them um, for recording in this space or at home. Brilliant. Thanks Thank so you. much. The modern day convenience of recording and listening to music is here to stay. But that doesn't mean we're forced to stick with what's new. Building the future and keeping the past alive 
are one and the same. Next time you hear music, whether it be listening to the radio, streaming a classic or new song, buying your own vinyl record, or even recording your own music, you'll know the experience and passion that goes into music and circulates throughout its beloved listeners. Well, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Soundscape. This is Rebecca Janney signing off. Thank you.